Okay, I'm going to be going through the uh, mid-year 2022 paper 2, okay, for Pure Chem, organizing paper. So let's go through the answers now. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so just take note, this one uh, doesn't include carboxylic acid, okay, for your organic chem. So under organic chem, it doesn't include your carboxylic acid. This also doesn't include your macromolecules or for your organic chem. Okay, so these are the two chapters that's out of this paper. Okay, this is just a quick intro on it. So let's start, let's go on to question one now. Okay, choose from the following elements to answer the questions below. So each element can be used once, more than once or not at all. So all of these are elements, so they are from your periodic table. Okay, the question is name an element which forms an acidic oxide. Name an element, okay, so the first one says forms an acidic oxide. So for acidic oxide, what you have is actually your non-metal oxides. Okay, so I'm looking out for a non-metal oxide. So generally, an ex uh, example okay, um, would be sulfur and carbon. Now, to be more precise, actually the element is sulfur, but the acidic oxide we are looking at for this is actually your sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide. Okay, these are the two oxides that actually are acidic. For carbon, okay, do take note. Okay, we are looking at actually carbon dioxide. Okay, please uh, know that carbon monoxide is not acidic. Huh? Carbon monoxide is not an acidic oxide. This is actually a neutral oxide. Okay, so for the first question, we are looking out really which of this is forms an acidic oxide. We are looking at which of this is a non-metal oxide. Okay, that will uh, give you an acidic oxide. Now, some of you may say, sure, how about argon? How about neon? Will these two be able to form acidic oxide? Answer is no, because they are noble gases, their electron, their valence electron shell is already fully filled. So they will not bond with oxygen, isn't it? Hence, they will not form acidic oxide. Okay, next. Um, which name an element which is a liquid at room temperature and pressure? So you know that my noble gases, argon and neon, are already out because they're noble gases. Hydrogen is a gas. Carbon and iron, these two are actually solid. Sulfur is also solid. So I'm left with bromine and iodine actually. So some students actually wrote iodine. Okay, because you know iodine as a brown solution. Now, I need you to take note of this. Okay, when we talk about a brown solution, iodine as a brown solution, we are actually looking at it as an I2 aqueous. So it's actually iodine dissolved in water. Okay, so it's an iodine solution. In if it is not dissolved in water, actually iodine exists as a purplish black, okay, or purple uh, um, solid. So it's not. I say again, it is actually not a liquid. Okay, so bromine itself is actually a reddish brown liquid. Okay, at room temperature and pressure. So just take note of that. So iodine is out because it is actually a purplish black solid. This is actually your I2 solid. Okay, this is actually the original state of iodine if you didn't dissolve it in water. But if you dissolve it in water, which is the one that we typically use for reactions, but it's actually I2 aqueous. So please take note of this. This guy here is actually my Br liquid. Okay, sorry, Br2 liquid. Okay? Bromine can also exist as what we call the bromine water. So just think of it, bromine water or bromine solution. Okay, bromine solution is actually uh, Br equals, Br2 equals, sorry. Let me rewrite this, huh? Br2 equals. Okay, so take note of the difference between the element and when it is dissolved in water. Okay, next, which of these reacts with aqueous copper 2 chloride to give a pink solid. So this pink solid is actually your copper metal. Okay, copper metal. So this copper metal, why does it uh, appear? It's really because what they're looking at is really something that can displace copper. So copper is being displaced. So which of this element can actually displace copper? We are looking at an element that's actually more reactive than copper, which is also a metal. Lah. Okay, so hence the answer is actually iron because iron is more reactive than copper. 
So it will actually displace copper from the copper 2 chloride. Hence, you are having that pink solid that's appearing, which is your copper metal. So this is actually, we are looking at a displacement reaction. Next. <coughs> which of these is formed during the electrolysis of concentrated aqueous sodium chloride? So I've got concentrated aqueous sodium chloride. Hence, what I'm going to do first thing, whenever you've got electrolysis, identify all the ions present. So because it's aqueous, and it's sodium chloride. So I know aqueous means there's a presence of water, which will, in the presence of the sodium chloride, I can think of it as there will be H plus ion. With the sodium chloride, I got Na plus. Because it's water, there will also be the OH minus ions, and there's also the Cl minus. In terms of the discharge, okay, I got Na plus, I got H plus. So what's going to happen, I know that this H plus will be preferred Okay, preferentially discharged. So H plus, I'm going to get the product of H2. Okay, H plus, I'm going to get the product of H2. So H2 is formed okay, at the cathode. Okay, at the cathode. If I got OH minus and Cl minus, so most of the time, OH minus will be prefer preferentially discharged. However, because it's concentrated, in concentrated solutions, the halide is preferentially discharged. Hence, chloride is the one that's going to be discharged. I'm going to get Cl2 gas. Okay, and my anode. So based on this, I realize it's either hydrogen or chlorine, but there's no chlorine present here. Therefore, my only answer can only be hydrogen. Last one, which has a giant molecular structure. This is actually for covalent bonding. Giant molecular structure is actually covalent bonding. Okay, what you learn under covalent bonding, there's giant molecular. Actually, there's only three of them in your textbook itself. Diamond, graphite, and the last one is silicon dioxide. Which is, they call it silica also. So all of these three, this guy here is out of the picture because it's not an element. Silicon dioxide is a compound. It's not an element, so it cannot be the answer. Okay, diamond is made of carbon. Graphite is also made of carbon. The bonding is slightly different. They are allotropes, okay? Carbon and diamond, they are actually allotropes. Okay, but in this question here, they want the element. So those of you who wrote diamond and graphite is wrong because they want the element. Therefore, the only answer can be is carbon. Okay, so please take note of this. So part, uh, part A, question one, part one to... Part A, part one to part five, these are all the answers. Next. They say potassium reacts with water under room temperature to produce a chemical reaction. Describe with the aid of an ionic equation. So I need to take note, this is ionic. So I will need my state symbols. Okay. I also need to dissociate my ions. Okay, make sure I dissociate the ions. Huh? What would you see? Okay, with the aid of an ionic equation, what would you see when potassium reacts with water? So, few things we accept. Effervescence occurred. This is because hydrogen is produced. In your textbook, if you look at the description, okay, you know that it will react violently, or you know that the reaction is also explosive. Now, in actual fact, if I want to use an equation to support what I see, okay, I most probably would think that this is the best answer I should give. Because if I look at the reaction itself, I look at the equation, okay, so let's go to the do the equation. Huh? To do ionic equation, first thing, you must have your chemical equation. So this is it. 2 potassium, solid, 2 water, liquid, produces 2 KOH equals plus H2 gas. Okay, balance it out. Take note, you must always have a balanced chemical equation before you go on to the ionic equation. So for ionic equation, next thing what you need to do is solid, liquid cannot split. The only one you can split is aqueous and hence KOH, you can split it down in K plus and OH minus. And because there's the 2 in front here, therefore you got your 2 and 2 over here. Okay, let me erase this one over here. Okay, so this is the ionic equation. Now, if you look at the ionic equation, you realize that, sure, I cannot see violent reaction. I cannot see explosive reaction. All I can see is most probably hydrogen is produced, causing effervescence. Hence, for B part 1, actually one of the best answers you could give is actually effervescence produced because hydrogen is formed. Okay? The other two is really what you will see. However, the ionic equation doesn't show. Okay, it doesn't show you that it's going to be violent. It doesn't show you that it's explosive.
Okay, however, what we did was we sort of like split it up into ionic equation as one part. The other thing is what would you see? Okay, and hence we will accept the whole range of answers. So just think note of that. Okay, but to be more precise, hydrogen being produced is actually the better answer. Next one, draw dot and cross to show the bonding in propene. So propene is actually under your is an alkene. Alkene general formula CnH2n. Prop tells you that there's three carbon present. So I know it's a C3H6. So I need to draw a C3H6. Whenever I need to draw a dot and cross for a carbon hydrogen or a hydrocarbon, actually I know that this is a covalent bonding. What I'll typically do okay, is to draw the structural formula. So I first thing when I need to draw hydrocarbons, okay, I will or draw organic compounds, I will typically always draw the carbon first. So I know that there's three carbons, so I'll draw three carbons. So first thing is carbon. I'll draw the number of carbons. Second thing, I'll add in the functional group. So in this case, I'll have a functional group. I can draw my double bond either on the right side or left side, but typically I'll always draw it from the left side onwards. Once I've done the functional group, okay, which I've drawn here, next I will just complete each carbon to have four bonds. And when I say it coming in four bonds, right, what does it bond with? Because it's a hydrocarbon. So this carbon here have two bonds already. I'm short of two more bonds. Means that this carbon actually bonds with two other hydrogen. This carbon here already has three bonds. So it's short of one more bond. I'll draw one bond to another hydrogen here. Last one, this carbon here has only one bond. So I need to draw three more hydrogens around it to complete the four bonds. Now this is the structural formula. This is not the dot and cross diagram. Okay, hence please don't stop here. What you do is from the structural formula convert to the dot and cross. And take note, this one here, this question never say draw only. They never say, they never say draw only the outer shell electrons or outer shell or your outer electron shell. So they never, never say this. So you draw all. Hence, what I'm going to do is First thing, I'll draw all my bonding things first. So carbon, draw one circle, big one. At the top, bonded to H. So I draw like this. On the left-hand side, bonded to H, like this. Down here, bonded to another carbon. So I know that there's overlapping region here. At the top, this carbon bond to another H. Okay, so I'm drawing here. On the right-hand side of this carbon, I know there's another overlapping region. As long as there's a bond, it means they must overlap. So these two carbons are bonded to each other. Then this carbon is bonded to three other H. One, two, three. Please make sure you have your H written there. I know many students always tend to forget the chemical symbol. Okay, now, once I've drawn all this, let's draw the shed electrons. So, one bond means one cross, one dot. One bond means one cross, one dot. Two bonds means cross, dot, cross, dot. Down here, cross, dot. Down here, single bond, cross, dot. All these are single bonds, so cross, dot, cross, dot, cross, dot. Okay, so this is my propene after it has uh, drawn all the, bond, uh, all the shed electrons. So what I've drawn so far is the shed electrons. Next thing i got to check do they have any unshed electrons? Okay, then, or I should say electrons not involved in bonding. So hydrogen, I know is 1-1. One, one, so there's only one electron. Okay, there's only one electron in the outermost shell. That's electronic configuration. Carbon is 6-12. Electronic configuration is 2-4. Okay, 2-4. So let's check my hydrogen first. Let's check hydrogen. Now, hydrogen only got one electron. Okay. In the valence shell, if one electron is used in bonding already, then it'll be done. Lah. Okay, then not, no unchecked electrons to draw. So this hydrogen over here, okay, let's just, okay, anyway, sorry, uh, let me pause here first. I just want to say this. Uh, let me close the thing. Uh, okay, uh, I don't have that function here, but never mind. Okay, so now this is called a dot and cross diagram. In case some of you are wondering, sure, uh, like, you know, should I like say this carbon is cross, that carbon is dot kind of thing? Okay. Take note, this is called dot and cross diagram. What it means is that the dot and cross is alternating between the different atoms. 
Okay, that's how you symbolize it. Symbolize it. So let's say for example, if I I use blue, okay? Blue, if I put a blue like this, put a blue square, means that this is representing a cross. If you see me draw a green square, it means it's to represent dot. Okay, that means the element, okay, um, electrons, I put it as cross. This, If I see a green square, the element is a dot. Okay, I mean, okay, later you see, later you see, I think the explanation is a bit weird now, but let's show you. Okay, so now, let's start. Let's assume that this hydrogen, I use a green square here to show. So that means the hydrogen here, the electrons is a dot. Okay, the electron here, the hydrogen, its electron is a dot. If this hydrogen electron is a dot, this carbon here, the electron must be a cross. Okay? So, cross. Next thing, anything around the cross must be dot. So therefore, this guy's electron, this hydrogen electron is a dot, this carbon electron is a dot. Since this carbon here, the electron is dot, Okay, this hydrogen must be a cross. This carbon here must be a cross. Then, so on and so forth. Okay, so really, the dot and cross is alternating. Okay. Now, so back to the question, is the drawing actually done? So hydrogen only have one valence electron. So you look at it, for all the green color one, all the green color hydrogen, I must make sure that I should see at least one dot. So one dot here, one dot, one dot, one dot, one dot. So all of the green ones, the hydrogens, I know that I've drawn all the electrons that's required. There's no electrons not involved in there are no electrons uh not involved in bonding. Same thing for carbon. If you have to go and count it, same thing for the H, you realize that all of them, the number of electrons are correct. Except for this carbon, okay, you realize you must draw the inner shell. So I need to draw this. Okay, as mentioned, it's a dot and cross diagram. So if this carbon I dictate as a cross, so I'm going to draw two cross over here. If this is cross, this carbon here will be a dot. If this is dot, this carbon here will be a cross. Okay, so it's an alternating dot and cross. That's why it's a dot and cross diagram to show the bonding between the different elements. Okay, so the actual diagram, of course, is without all the circle, without all the colored. Oh no, okay, sorry. Uh, oh no. Okay, let me, let me erase, erase, ah, erase, erase, let me erase everything so that you look nicer. Okay, so your final answer, let me draw them out again carefully. So this will be your final answer. Okay, translate the structural formula into a dot and cross diagram. Okay, so this is how you go about doing it. Of course, the other way, simplest way is, um, you know, hydrogen is going to form a duplex structure. Lah. So you just ask yourself, does the hydrogen already have two electrons? Carbon is gonna reach octet structure in the outermost shell. So ask yourself, this hydro this this carbon gonna form octet structure. Check whether the carbon has eight electrons or not. Okay, so that's uh, how you go about doing this question over here. Okay, so this is the final drawing. Okay, next one A two. Iron is one of the most important metals. It's a transition metal. Most iron is used in an alloy steel. Explain in metallic bonding in terms of metallic bonding why iron is a good conductor of electricity. So I'm looking at metallic bonding, good conductor of electricity. Now, whenever you've got bonding question, actually it's always best to write down the structure, okay, with how the bonding occurs within the structure itself. So iron has a giant lattice structure, or sometimes they will say metal lattice structure. Okay, these two terms are used in your textbook. Okay, what exactly is a metal lattice structure or a giant lattice structure about for metals? It is that it has positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. Or sometimes they'll use the word mobile, C or mobile electrons. So that is describing the bonding, the structure with how the things inside are arranged. Okay, then why is it a good conductor of electricity? How does the struct, how does the bonding relates to its a physical property of a good conductor of electricity? Right, it is because they have a sea of mobile electrons. The electrons are actually free to move, which is the same as mobile. And when they are free to move, they are mobile. Actually, they also means that they are can act as mobile charge carriers. Okay, as long as you give me any one of these terms here, 
or you'll get your second mark for being able to say that they are good electrical conductivities. They, iron are good electrical conductors. Next one, part B. Okay, describe how different proportions of carbon can modify the physical properties of steel. Okay, this is one part that most students always miss out to study. Okay, it's actually after your blast furnace, they talk about um, steel. Okay, they talk about um, iron and then talk about how iron can be produced into steel. Okay, so what we're looking at when we talk about different proportions of carbon, we're looking at high carbon steel and low carbon steel itself. Okay, different proportion of carbon. That's why high carbon, low carbon. So for high carbon steel, they are strong but brittle. Okay, they are strong but brittle. The word brittle here actually is especially important because if I compare high and low carbon steel, you realize both are strong. But for low carbon steel, they are malleable. So brittle and malleable sort of like, they are like a related in the opposite sense. So malleable means that I can easily uh, shape them. Okay, shape them. Okay, it means I hammer into thin sheets. Uh, that's what people always say. Uh, I can hammer them into thin sheets. Thin sheets. Okay, so they can be shaped. Whereas when you talk about brittle, right, you know the idea of brittle, once you hammer it, the thing will actually shatter to pieces. So it's easy to fracture it, it's easy to cause cracks. So really high carbon steel is easier to cause cracks, whereas for low carbon steel is more malleable. This has to do with the idea of the disruption, okay? This has to do with the idea of the disruption to the regular arrangement of the metal atoms in pure metal. So just take note, okay, you can go and read out more on this one. I think you all have understood why alloys are harder. So, but why more carbon would cause the things to be more brittle and less carbon will be more malleable, you will be able to understand if you go and read out on that part. Okay, next, C part 1. State the essential conditions needing, needed for rusting of iron. So we are looking out for water and oxygen. Those of you who gave air, you're not being specific enough. Those of you who say damp, you're not being specific enough. Because really, really, it's not about air. It's about the oxygen in the air. It's not about being damp. It's really about the water, the presence of water that's causing the rust itself. So please take note. Okay, so air, damp, nah, 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 nah. Okay, water and oxygen. C part 2. Okay, a sample of compound iron is analyzed. The, it contains all this. So this is looking at your empirical formula under your mole calculation. Okay, this is actually quite a standard question because if it comes out, you just need to follow a whole system. It's very systematic how you can get to the final answer. Okay, so first thing, you write all the mass down. Next, you have all the MR. Eh, you have all the AR, okay? Atomic, relative atomic mass. Then next, you divide by, uh, you take the mass. To find the mole, you take the mass divided by the AR. Sometimes your first line may not be mass. Sometimes your first line could be percentage mass. Okay? But to always get to the third row, it's always the first row divided by the second row, which is, it could be percentage mass divided by AR. So it's always divided by AR to find the third row. Now, one common mistake people have is they round up too early. Okay, so in terms of finding the third row, which is the number of moles or the um, relative mole proportion, okay, actually what I'll suggest is uh, 3DP, uh, not 3DP, uh, 3SF or even smaller. Okay, you want 5SF also can. Okay, some students actually round up to 0.03 instead of 0, 0, 0 0.00348 for this one over here, and hence they, uh, they messed up this question. Okay, so once you have done the calculation over here, how to get to the next row, it's always divide by the smallest number, smallest mole. So in this case, 0 0.0140, 0 0.00348, 0 0.0, when you look at all these numbers, you know, right? you will realize that this is the smallest. Now, some people thought this was the smallest, 0 0.0140, because they just look at the first digit. They forgot that down here got one extra zero. So please be careful. Huh? Okay, really look at your numbers carefully. Once I divide by the smallest number, you realize that your ratio will be about 4 is to 1 is to 6 is to 6. Hence, you got K4, Fe, C6, N6. Okay, so the how we are allocating the marks is sort of like this. Okay, so this is how we allocate the three marks. Now, uh, I got some students who are careless. Okay, potassium, instead of writing K, they wrote P. 
take note, P is not potassium. P is actually a phosphorus. So, please be very careful when you're writing the chemical symbol, okay? Be very familiar with it so that you don't make such common mis uh, make such uh, minor mistakes, okay, which is going to cost you your marks, huh? Next. Okay, sulfur tetrafluoride SF4 can be made by combining gaseous sulfur with fluorine. This reaction can be catalyzed by the addition of aqueous copper 2 sulfate. This is catalyzed by aqueous copper 2 sulfate. It means copper 2 sulfate never take part in the reaction. Okay? It never sort of like get involved in the whole... Uh, it got involved in the reaction, but you realize that uh, it shouldn't be in your equation itself. Okay? So this is um, the overall equation. Overall equation. Huh? So you realize copper 2 sulfate is not inside over here. Right, because copper 2 sulfate is a catalyst, it will not be included in your overall equation. Okay, so S, sulfur in the gaseous state plus 2 fluorine in the gaseous state give me SF4 in the gaseous state. They say heat energy is released to the surrounding. Heat energy is released. So this is exothermic. Now, so all these little clues you must take note. If it's exothermic, what does it tell me? It tells me that my delta H enthalpy change must be negative. Okay? They say, complete the energy profile diagram for the reaction between sulfur and fluorine. It should include formulae of the products of the reaction. Actually, formula, that's one product only. And labels of the enthalpy change of reaction and activation energy. So this is how it looks. What is in the question originally is uh, just like this. With S gas plus 2 F2 gas. So what are the rest of the things you must do? First thing, because you know it's exothermic, you know the product must have a lower Okay, energy level. So therefore, you know it's always a curve up. Okay, let me use blue to show you the, the actual answer. Huh? So what I will do first, I will draw my general curve. Okay, and my product is of a lower level. Then after that, I know my product is SF4, so I'll write SF4, guess over here. Next. Once I've done this, okay, I'm going to draw the enthalpy. So I'll draw dot 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 dot. From the reactant, I draw to the product. Then I'll label delta H equals to negative. Because I know it's exothermic. Hence, it's important to just not just label delta H, but label delta H as negative because it's pointing downwards. Next, activation energy. So from the reactant, I draw dot 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 dot. Activation energy is from the reactant, I draw up to the highest point of the whole graph. And I label this as EA. Those of you who kiasu are, you scared che, EA, maybe people don't understand. So you write activation energy. Okay, so my suggestion is always to just have the labels in full, then you write your short form. Same thing, you need not write delta H equals negative, you can write enthalpy change. Comma, delta H equals negative. So make your labeling as clear as possible. Okay, with the details that you know is definitely correct. Okay, so this is um, for A part 1. Okay, do take note, you shouldn't draw double-headed arrows because there is a direction in this. So the activation energy is from the reactant to the highest point. Enthalpy is from the reactant to the product. Okay, to the product. So please, I say again, please, okay, take note, no double-headed arrows. And next thing, delta H must have a sign. If it's endothermic, then of course the drawing will be different. Okay, so let's say assuming really endothermic, huh? so I'm just going to draw for you to see. Okay, please label energy slash kilojoules, progress of reaction. So if it's endothermic, my reactant will be lower, my product will be higher, and it will look like this. Okay, if I want to label all my stuff properly, okay, so I'm going to write my reactant. I'm going to write my product. Okay, I'm going to use green to label the rest of the stuff. So, dot, 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 dot. From the reactant to the highest point. So, I'm using pink now. From the reactant to the highest point. Okay, sorry, ah, I think that is the highest point. This is my activation energy. Okay? From my reactant to the product. Reactant to the product, like this. This is my delta H. And because you can see it's upwards, so this is actually equals to positive. So labeling, important. Please make sure you label carefully. Okay? Next. 
Part 2. During the reaction, the amount of energy given out is 1,000. Energy given out is 1,120 kilojoules. Now, because you already know it's exothermic, this value here actually is a negative 1,120 kilojoules. That's the delta H. Okay, so take note. Always remember, given out. Don't just assume that the number is always positive. Ask yourself, is it about given, giving out or whether is it about taking in? Okay, so the delta H is negative 1,120 kilojoules. The FF bond energy is 160 kilojoules per mole. Use this information to determine the bond energy of 1 SF bond in SF4. Include structural equation. So it's about an equation with the structural formulas. So what I know is from this reaction, 1 sulfur react with 2 fluorines to give me SF4. So in actual fact, if I look at the structural formula, sulfur plus 2 fluorine okay, will give me SF4. So this is actually how the structural formula looks. If I look at it carefully, for me to form SF4, what I need to do is, I need to break 1, 2. Break 2 FF bond. Sulfur, I don't need to care because sulfur is not bonded to anything else. Hence, I don't need to care about what bonds there is to break for sulfur. Okay, looking at here, okay, I know that I need to form 4 SF bond. Now, then some of you must say, sure, why am I so concerned about breaking and forming bond? Because delta H, if you look at the next step now, delta H can be calculated with bond break minus bond make. That's again. Delta H can be calculated as bond break minus the bond make. Therefore, what I know is negative 1120, okay, which is my delta H, the negative sign important, so take note. This is actually equivalent to breaking 2 FF bond, which is 2 times 160, minus 4 times of the SF bond. So you realize when you got this equation here, you just need to manipulate a bit. So those of you who math a bit cannot make it. Huh? So 1120 equals to 320 minus 4S. My writing. Sorry, huh? 4SF bond. So what you realize you bring over, this one is 1120 minus 320 equals to negative 4SF. Do your math. You realize you're going to get from this step, you're going to go to here. And then if you were to just remove the minus sign, you divide by 4, each of the SF bond is actually 360. Those of people common mistake, okay, it's actually that they forgot the minus sign over here, which then their un calculated answer will actually be less than 360. Okay, so therefore, that's one mistake here. Second thing is they do not know what is the, what am I supposed to do for the structural equation. So take note, this equation is actually about drawing the structural formula, and hence this is what's required of you. So draw every single bond there. Okay, so that's for this part 2 over here. Now let's go on to part B. Okay, a student electrolyzes aqueous copper 2 chloride using the apparatus shown. Okay, this is the power supply. They tell you this is positive terminal, negative terminal. These are carbon electrodes. Equals copper 2 chloride. Effervescence can be observed at a positive electrode. Okay, construct half equation for the reaction at a negative. So take note, positive, negative, different. Now, what goes, to the, what goes to the positive electrode? Because it is positive, it will actually attract negative. What the, what the crap is your negative ions, right? It's actually your anions. So we are looking at anions being attracted there. For my negative electrode, it will attract my positive ions. Okay, positive ions. So therefore, I'm looking at cations being attracted there. So what is happening at the negative electrode? Because this aqueous copper 2 chloride, or right, aqueous copper 2 chloride. So what we have here, if I want to focus on the cations, I actually have H plus, I actually have Cu2 plus. Right, some of you are asking, Cher, if, what if it's concentrated? What if it is uh, diluted? Actually, you realize concentrated and diluted only affects my anion. It doesn't affect the cations. So H plus and Cu2 plus, in terms of your metal reactivity series, you realize that Cu is at the bottom, hence Cu2 plus is preferentially, preferentially discharged. Okay, sorry, huh? I realize that the thing is too low. My pen can't write properly. Alright, preferentially discharged. And hence, 
I'm looking at the reaction of copper 2 plus being reduced. So Cu2 plus in equal state because I want a ionic half equation, I need my state symbol. They already said include state symbol as well. So Cu2 plus in the equal state is going to become copper solid, so it's going to gain two electrons. So this is my ionic half equation, okay, at the negative electrode. So those of you who wrote H plus because you see effervescence, now please don't get tricked. Think note, one is talking about positive electrode, one is negative electrode. So be very clear, read your question carefully, dissect the question. So with part one, you know that copper solid is formed. Then they ask you, describe what the student observes at the negative electrode. So this is leading up to here. Hence, I know I will see copper depositing. So therefore, a reddish brown or pink solid actually deposits. Okay, because copper is forming. Now, if I've got more and more copper forming at the electrode, I could also say that the mass of the electrode actually increased. Mass of the electrode increased. Or if you go by just looking at it, you know the size of the electrode actually increased. Okay, so um, do take note. Either one of these is accepted. Either you can say copper depositing, the mass is increasing or the size is increasing. All these are observable. But please don't say copper solid deposited because you can't see that that thing is a copper. You are inferring already. So you are saying that the pink solid is copper. It's an inference. What you can only observe is that a solid, which is pink or reddish brown is formed. You can't see that the, that solid is exactly copper. So be careful of the word observation. Right? Because these are only things that you can write. The things you can write down only can be observed through your senses. Right? Your five senses, huh? Okay, part 3. Give one similarity and one differences between the products of the electrolysis of aqueous and concentrated aqueous copper 2 chloride. So, okay, sorry, uh, uh, actually this is a, of a diluted, sorry if I say uh, spelling error here. Uh. Okay, so this is already diluted and concentrated aqueous copper 2 chloride at the cathode. Okay, so in both setup, copper will be formed. As I mentioned, concentrated or diluted, the cathode, the cation will not be affected. So copper will still be deposited at the cathode. This is the product. You cannot, I say again, you cannot say that Cu2 plus is discharged because this is not the product. Cu2 plus being discharged is not the product. Okay, therefore this is actually a wrong answer. You cannot give this. The product is actually copper forming. Next thing, what's the difference? The difference actually comes with because this is a halide solution the preferential discharge of a halide will be favoured. Okay, the halide will be actually preferentially discharged. It will be favoured at the anode. So if I got electrolysis of dilute aqueous okay, copper 2 chloride, I know that oxygen gas will be produced. Why? Because in the diluted form, I know that there's OH minus. I know there's Cl minus. In the diluted dilute aqueous copper 2 chloride, I know that this is favoured for diluted dilute solution. If I've got concentrated solution, the halide is preferred. So my OH minus, okay, will actually form water. It will actually form O2, and actually it will form electrons. Okay, what is the number that you need to remember for this? Okay, so the number you need to remember is four hydroxide. I'm gonna give you two water, one oxygen, okay, one right? <coughs> four one, four two one. Okay, four, two, one, four. So this is the overall, this is the half equation actually at the end when <coughs> hydroxide ion is preferentially discharged. Okay, so that's why oxygen gas is produced. However, if it's concentrated, I know that the chlorine, okay, the chloride will be preferentially discharged, hence chlorine gas will be formed. So I got my Cl minus, two of them, forming Cl2, giving me two electrons. So this is the what is happening at the anode itself. Okay, so please take note of the reaction and hence these are the products. So those of you who say hydroxide discharge, chloride discharge, you realize you're not answering the question. The question here is the products. So read the question carefully, okay, each time. Okay, so there are some answers that you must give us. So in this case, product, you must give the product itself. Okay, but of course if they ask you which ions are being discharged, what's the difference? Then, of course, that's where your answers are going to change a little bit. So, be careful. Take note of it. Next one, A4. 
Okay, the experiment, the results of experiment on electrolysis using platinum electrodes are given a table, complete the table, the first line completed for you. So you know, electrolyte molten, product will be lead, bromine, and when it is molten, it's used up. Okay, used up. Huh? Let's see any other clue given. Huh? Okay. okay, used up. Okay, then you see potassium hydroxide form, hydrogen bromine. Okay, never mind. Let's do step by step first. If I look at the first line, now I look at the second line. Used up. So most probably it's going to be molten. Okay, because if it's um, maybe aqueous one, I may not get all used up, right? Then I got potassium as, at the negative electrode. Hence, I know that my cation will be K+. Plus. Iodine is the product at the positive electrode. So I know that I should have my I-. minus. So therefore, this will be molten potassium iodide. Okay. Next. I dilute aqueous sodium chloride. So what is going to be the product at the negative electrode? So because it's dilute, I know that there must be H+, plus because of the water present, and Na+. Plus. At the, uh, that's at the cathode. At the anode, okay, I know that I will have OH-, minus and I'll have Cl-. minus. So because it's diluted solution, okay, I know that Na+, plus won't be discharged, H+, plus will be discharged. I know that because it is um, diluted, it's chlorine and hydroxide. Hydroxide will be the one preferentially discharged. So my H plus is going to form my H2 gas. Okay? So 2H plus plus 2 electrons are going to give you my H2 gas. For this one here, I actually drawn just now. So it's actually 4OH minus giving me uh, 2 water, 1 oxygen plus 4 electrons. That's why my products is water and oxygen. So you can see here hydrogen gas, water and oxygen. And hence, what's left? Imagine I got lesser and lesser hydrogen, lesser and lesser hydroxide. So I'm going to get a more concentrated sodium chloride solution because I got lesser and lesser water. Okay, you realize that by doing this, you're actually doing an electrolysis of water. Okay, so I've got lesser and lesser water. Hence, my solution actually becomes more and more concentrated. So just take note. Next one. Hydrogen. Discharge as a product. Bromine discharge as a product. But I got potassium hydroxide. Which tells you that in my anode, okay, let's say I have to write my anode and my cathode. Ah, based on the product hydrogen, I know I must have H+. Based on the leftover, I know that there must be K+. Plus. Okay, at the cathode. So these are my cations present at the cathode. Based on bromine being discharged, I know that I must have Br-. minus. I would have also OH- minus present. Now, K+, plus, H+, plus, you know that H+, plus will definitely be discharged. And hence, that's why you got potassium left. So I know it's potassium. Next thing, because hydroxide, is left over, bromine is preferentially discharged. Therefore, I know that my solution must be concentrated because only when I have a concentrated potassium bromide solution, concentrated, then my halide can be preferentially discharged. So therefore, my answer here will be concentrated potassium bromide. Right? Concentrated potassium bromide. Okay, so take note, huh? because of the Halide being preferentially discharged. Next, concentrated magnesium chloride. So what's at the cathode? What's at the anode? So at the cathode, concentrated solution, right? So I know I got H+, plus, I got Mg2+. Plus. I know that at the anode, I would have OH-, minus, I would have Cl-. minus Because it's concentrated, Cl is preferentially discharged. H+, plus is preferentially discharged at the cathode. So therefore, my product will be hydrogen, chlorine. Okay? What's left? Can you see here? These two things are left. That's why it's magnesium hydroxide actually formed. So it's actually quite a cool thing by doing electrolysis of your concentrated halides. Actually, you get a, a sort of like a base forming. Okay? So this whole question is on electrolysis. You realize the key to doing this is to identify your cathode. Okay? Ions at the cathode. And, okay, sorry, maybe I shouldn't write cathode ions, huh? 
identify the cations at the cathode, identify the anions at the anode. Okay, and then you need to know your um, which of the ions are pref the preference for discharge. Okay, what we call the electrochem series. Huh? Okay, so if you know the preference for discharge, you're going to know what's roughly going to happen there. Okay, so let's go next. Question 5. Bromine water, which is a bromine solution. That's why you realize, nah, just like I mentioned, huh? so bromine water, bromine solution, you realize it's aqueous. Was added to aqueous potassium sulfide. So this is the equation here. You realize, Cher, where is the potassium? So by looking at this, you realize, Cher, this is actually the ionic equation. Right? The spectator ion, which is potassium, this is the spectator ion, has been excluded from the equation itself. Okay, so just take note of that. Then they say, describe what you will observe when the reaction occurs. Now, bromine water is a reddish-brown solution. A okay, reddish-brown solution. Now, if I add a reddish-brown solution in, Br2 equals, after that, my Br2 equals actually become Br minus equals. This guy here actually doesn't give you a color. It's actually a colorless solution. So that's why my first observation is the bromine water actually turns from reddish brown to colorless. Or actually, to be exact, right, actually my solution turns from reddish brown to colorless because my bromine water actually decolorizes. Okay? So the bromine water turns from reddish brown to colorless upon reaction. Okay, because you can see Br2 equals now become 2Br minus. So it has from the uh, element form, it has gone to the ion form. So it's now from halogen to a halide. Next one, I will say a yellow solid or yellow precipitate form. Some of you say, sure, where is the yellow precipitate? It's actually this fellow over here, sulfur. This is actually a yellow solid. So from a sulfide, this guy here is actually just a part of a solution. So actually in a solution form. Uh, it's actually an ion in the solution. Okay, so equal state. After that, it became solid. So you realize you will see precipitate forming. Okay, why we are looking out for the word yellow is we hope we will need you to know that the sulfur is actually a yellow color precipitate, yellow color solid. Or as already mentioned before, so take note of that. So these are two observations. Those of you who only write one observation, you realize it's insufficient because this is a two mark answer. So two marks typically you need to write down at least two solid points coming in. Okay. Next A five A five part two A five A part two. Okay. So explain in terms of electron transfer why bromine is the oxidizing agent. Now, whenever you have a redox question, you need to talk about where is the reduction, where is the oxidation. So write both. So what I need to know is that first thing I want to in terms of electron transfer, right? Can you see it's a S2 minus becoming S. So therefore, actually, I lost two electrons. So each sulfide ion actually lost two electrons to form sulfur. Hence, this is really oxidation. Now, so sulfide is oxidized. Then the question is, where did the electrons go to? So I know that each of my bromine, so Br2 became 2Br-, minus, right? This is because two electrons are gained. Two electrons are gained here. So each bromine, can you see now you have two R? So each of the bromine here actually gained one electron to form a bromide ion. And where did the electron come from? This electron come from the sulfide ion. Okay, and because the bromine atom gained one electron, it is reduced. Okay, so bromine is reduced. Sulfur is oxidized. So because the bromine gained one electron from the sulfur, and hence it took the electrons, right, from sulfur, hence it is the oxidizing agent. So because bromine is reduced, it gained the electrons from sulfur, therefore it is the oxidizing agent. Okay, so write the points about which substance is reduced, which substance is oxidized, based on, in this case here, electron transfer. Okay, so actually you can look at the chart to sort of like have an understanding of what is actually happening. Okay, so that's for A5A part 2. A5B, part B. La. The wall that is made of iron oxidizes when current passes through it. Okay, so describe the reaction at stage 2. So, at stage 2, is over here. So what exactly is happening? 
is actually a precipitation. This is actually your very simple QA, something they always done. By having hydroxide present, by having iron 2 present, you actually get your precipitate over here. So this is actually a precipitation reaction. The question, which is the one mark, they just ask, think, asking you, okay, what kind of reaction is this? It's a precipitation. Or the reaction caused an insoluble substance to be formed. Okay, so they didn't write the state symbols here because it is assumed that you will know that this guy here is a solid since you have done so much of QA to understand all this. Okay, yep, so that's for this part over here. Okay, now let's go on to A6 part A. The halogens are a group of non-metals in group 7 of the periodic table. So group 7, okay. The reactivity of halogen decreases down the group. Okay, there's a very nice tell you this. Describe with an equation and experiment which shows that chlorine is more reactive than iodine. All you need to do is to describe or to show that chlorine can displace iodine. That's all we need you to show us. And hence, the classic one that you can do is you add chlorine water, which is Cl2 aqueous, to my potassium iodide. Because I know that chlorine is more reactive than iodine, the chlorine will displace the iodine from the iodide solution. Okay, so as you can see here, K and I are together. After I add chlorine in, the chlorine, it became a chloride ion because the chlorine actually displaced the iodide. And what I'm going to observe is actually a brown solution is formed. This brown solution actually is your I2 aqueous. Okay, I2 aqueous. So the brown solution is actually your iodine in the solution form. So this experiment we are looking at, that we are describing, is actually a displacement reaction. Okay, so as long as I show chlorine can displace iodine, of course, because they're both halides, you have successfully shown that halo the chlorine is more reactive than my iodine. Okay, next. Halogens form interhalogen compounds. They are, these are compounds which contain two different halogens. Okay. Deduce the formula of a compound which has composition 0.013 moles of iodine, 0.065 moles of fluorine atoms. So this is iodine and fluorine just combined together to form a compound. So if you look at the number of moles, key idea here is just to find the ratio. So the ratio is actually I is to F is 1 is to 5. Therefore, formula is actually IF5. This is just a very simple one mark to see whether you understand what exactly does an interhalogen compound is. And second thing, can you make sense of the mole values given to you? Okay, so that's for part B. Next, part C. In two separate experiments, hydrogen was passed over heated magnesium oxide and heated copper 2 oxide. Describe and explain the observation. Now, what's important here is I need to know what kind of reaction is happening. In chemistry, the knowing what reaction is happening is going to be critical in order for you to know what to explain exactly. So hydrogen being passed over these two actually is under your metals chapter. Okay, it's about the reduction by hydrogen. So the key idea here is about how reactive the metal is compared to hydrogen. So um, let's not look at the first point first, let's look at the second point. The first point is actually just directly to the answer, the observation. But let's look at the reason why first. We know that hydrogen is less reactive than magnesium. Right, we know that magnesium is on top, hydrogen is in the middle, copper is at the bottom. So magnesium is the most reactive one. So hydrogen is less reactive than magnesium, okay, but more reactive than copper. So you can see from here. So hydrogen can displace or reduce copper from copper to oxide because it's more reactive. But it cannot displace or it cannot reduce magnesium from magnesium oxide because it's less reactive. So this is the concept behind this question. This is the concept behind this question. And because of this concept, we can safely say that therefore, copper 2 oxide, okay, what's going to happen? A pinkish, a pink or reddish brown solid will be formed. This is actually my copper solid forming. Okay, because I'm asking for observation, please don't tell me copper is formed. Okay, you must tell me the observation. So, a pink solid is formed or reddish brown solid is formed. While for magnesium oxide, there's no observable change because hydrogen cannot reduce the magnesium in the magnesium oxide. So knowing the concept, knowing what reaction is actually happening is important. Okay, so metals, there's a reduction by hydrogen segment. Please think of that. Next, part D. Explain why lead reacts with nitric acid, but gold does not. 
So many of you think that this is an acid-base reaction that we're looking at. Yes, it is. But to answer this, we are looking once again back to the metal reactivity series. Your lead is on top of hydrogen, but below gold. Okay, hydrogen is between lead and gold. So actually very similar to C part uh, to C. Okay? So lead is more reactive than hydrogen, but gold is less reactive than hydrogen. Okay, lead is more reactive on top, but gold is less reactive than hydrogen. Now in the nitric acid, right, actually it is H and O3. You realize there's the H plus ions. So you can see this like it's a displacement reaction, like really. So because lead is more reactive than hydrogen, the hydrogen here will be displaced. So lead will displace hydrogen by reacting with nitric acid and it will form my lead 2 nitrate and hydrogen gas. Okay, so state the products that's formed. Don't just say it will react, but what products are actually being formed here. So I'll form my lead 2 nitrate and hydrogen gas while my gold will not react acid because it's less reactive as mentioned. So reactivity. So your metal reactivity series, critical. You realize electrolysis need it, these chapters also need it. Question 7. One type of cracking produces an alkane and an alkene. Complete an equation for the cracking of heptane. Heptane is a 7 carbon uh, alkane. Alkane, it will became an alkane and a propene. So what I know is there's propene, right? Propene is C3H6. Just not at the start already, got draw, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write my C3H6 first. Once I've written C3H6, what's left over, I'll have there. So I know it was 7 carbon. 3 carbon is already taken up, therefore I, my alkane will be C4. 16 hydrogen at the start, 6 hydrogen went to the propene, therefore I have 10 hydrogens left. So therefore, this is my alkane here, this is actually a butane. So this is a very simple question, it's literally like doing math. It's about the conservation of mass. Okay, conservation of mass, or you can think of conservation of my atoms. Okay, my atoms cannot disappear out of nowhere lah. A7 part B. Draw two repeating unit structure. So I'm supposed to draw two repeating unit. Okay. Structure of a polymer. So I'm supposed to have two repeating unit of a polymer huh? formed from the following. So this is a monomer. This guy here, they say from the following monomer. This is a monomer. Now to do repeating unit. Okay. So I'll, I mentioned before, if you know the monomer, you want to get to the polymer, right? So monomer, you must break it down to form the repeating unit. From the repeating unit, then you can form my polymer. So, in this case here, they want two repeating unit structure of the polymer. So, two repeating unit. Actually, that's the main thing. I want two repeating unit. So, first thing, organize your monomer first. Because this is focusing on the double bond. I say again, this is focusing on double bond. This is like alkene. This is addition reaction, right? So, I rearrange until my double bond is in the middle. All my other atoms, all my other groups or other elements are placed to the top and the bottom. So I'm going to take this and shift it up. I'm going to take this and shift it down. I'm going to take this whole thing here and shift it up. Okay, I'm going to take this whole thing here and shift it down. So what I'm going to have here, now see, uh, look at my this diagram over here. My hydrogen on the left side shifted up. Hydrogen on the bottom shifted down. This whole big group here, let's condense this. This is actually a O. Let me just draw the whole thing. Let's draw the whole thing. Okay, so O. Then this O is bonded to a carbon. Double bond O, CH3. Bottom H over here. So this is my monomer. This is my monomer. How exactly to form a repeating unit? What you're going to do is to break the double bond. Okay, break the double bond. And then the second step is to have the bonds extend to the side. Extend bonds to the side. So what I'm going to have here, how to convert this from a monomer to a repeating unit. It's going to look like this. So same thing, I'm going to draw everything here. So I'm going to draw exactly the same first. Okay, before I break the bond. So I'm going to just show you the process of it. Okay, let's condense this whole thing here. It's going to be a OC, OCH3. Okay. Now let's break the bond. So I'm going to break one of the bond. Okay. Break one of the bond. 
then I extend to the side. So this is one repeating unit. What if I want two? Just think of repeating unit like a stamp. So I, if I want the form of the polymer, I just take the repeating unit like a stamp. I just repeat the same unit over and over again to form the whole polymer. So if this is one repeating unit, how to draw two repeating units? So therefore, take this whole thing, copy and paste one more time. So C, C, H, H, extend the arm, H, O, C, O, C, H, 3. Okay, so this is the one where I now have two repeating units. Okay, if I only want repeating unit, you realize I got no bracket, no nothing, it's just like that. Okay, so this is the repeating unit. Now then, I just complete the whole thing. Huh? So how does this convert into the polymer? So I'm going to draw the structure of the polymer, right? What I'm going to do, let's assuming i got two repeating units again. So C, H, H, C, and then I have the arm here. O, C, O, C, H, 3. H, C, H, H, C, O, C, O, C, H, 3. H at the bottom. Now, to form the polymer, it will be a bracket. Like this, can you see down here it's extending out, uh, extending out, uh, and then to the power, of, and then subscript M, N over here. Okay, so this is the polymer. So take note, uh, polymer. So monomer with the double bond. Repeating unit is when the double bond has been broken and the hands are extended out. The polymer is the one with the bracket and the N over there. So please take note of this. Okay, the difference between all this, whether monomer, repeating unit, or the polymer. Uh. Okay, now let's go on to section B. Right, section B now. Okay, so there are three questions over here, but let's go through the first one. Okay, the last question is either in the form of... Okay, let's go B8. Negative oxygen ion face mask. It is time to unmask the truth about negative oxygen ion face mask. Okay, sounds cool, huh? especially COVID, everybody all very scared, right? So this is the negative oxygen ion face mask that's in vending machine across Singapore. So whenever you got such data questions, really, really read. Okay, as again, read the question carefully. Okay, complaining about face masks that are wearing the sweltering heat of Singapore, it is much worse in 19, like, 1900s when masks were uncomfortable, unwieldy, and unsightly, yet they were essentials. Okay, please think, no, uh, anything can related, then you start to underline. For now, so far, not so bad yet. These are all just describing the mask. The COVID-19 world is a strange place. The negatives were positive. We pray for negative results when we go for swap tests. The US President Donald Trump joked that he was tested positively toward negative. Whatever. Uh, now we even have a negative oxygen ion face mask. What that does the positive thing to provide cleaner air qualities. Okay, so first thing maybe about chem. The mask provide cleaner air qualities. Okay, what exactly does this mean? Maybe cleaner air qualities and atmosphere. Oh yes, sorry, I forgot to realize. I realized that this question don't have uh this whole topic, this whole chapter don't have air and atmosphere. Okay, because we haven't covered it yet also. Okay? So cleaner air quality is let's say air and atmosphere is in the chapter, in, in the test. Actually this one is something that could come out. Next. Okay, they say there are many types of oxygen containing ions that are negatively charged. In minerals like sodium oxide and calcium oxide. Oxygen exists as a monoatomic oxide. Monatomic, monoatomic or monatomic actually just means one atom. So it's a one atom oxide ion. So that's why you realize it is O2 minus because it's only one atom involved here. Okay? O2 minus. And it's an anion because 2 minus. Lah. Okay, so oxygen exists as what we call a monatomic oxide anion. There are also polyatomic means more than one, more than one atom. Okay, actually, more two or more atom, two or more uh, atom. Okay, two or more atom. And ions. One example is called the superoxide ion. So O two minus. So it's a O. This one, O two minus. So it's a O two with a single negative charge. Okay, O two. So two oxygen combined with a single negative charge. It contains a single covalent bond between its two oxygen atoms. So actually, it's just a diagram at the bottom here. So superoxide. So two O combined with a single bond in between, single covalent bond. Only one of the two atoms have a stable octet structure. Only one. The other has seven electrons. 
So these kind of things, once you have it, you realize when it's in a paragraph, it's harder. It's either you underline it or you extract the key details here. So you know that one oxygen has a stable octet. The other oxygen, one oxygen has only seven electrons. So write down these points. Another polyatomic ions, uh, polyatomic anion oxygen can form is peroxide anion. So peroxide is over here. A uh, superoxide peroxide contains a single covalent bond between its two oxygen atoms. However, both atoms have a stable octet electron structure. So this one, two oxygen, both of them have a stable octet. So annotate on your diagrams like this. This is going to help you to try to elaborate and explain certain things. Okay? So let's go on next. They say, yet oxygen mainly exists as diatomic molecules in the lower atmosphere. So diatomic molecules. Okay, so there's, you know there's O2. Compared to superoxide and peroxide, oxygen molecules are more stable. Okay. Only when energy is supplied would the stable oxygen molecules gain extra electrons to form superoxide and peroxide. So you know that these two forms here, for the superoxide and peroxide, energy needs to be supplied. Write down all these little points, okay? Because this may help you to quickly get to the respective segment, okay? If let's say it's being tested. So what is in what is the cotton in our mask? So they say for face masks to produce negative oxygen ions, its cotton layer must lose its electron to the oxygen molecules that passes through it. Physicists call the loss and gain of electrons upon contact. Triboelectrification. Okay, triboelectrification. Loss and gain of electrons. So you know loss gain electrons, where do you see it? One thing, one area is bonding. Loss gain electrons. This is ionic bonding. Second place where you actually see loose gain electrons is actually under the chapter of redox. So it could be under redox, it could be under bonding. We see how it goes later on. Furthermore, oxygen molecules only gain an extra electron when sufficient energy is supplied. Currently, there's no strong scientific evidence that the cotton layer can produce sufficient negative oxygen ions to have any effect on virus particles. So they're trying to tell you this is bullshit. Huh? Okay? But, but since it's mentioned here, maybe something about like this may come out. Huh? Okay, next. Trouble with oxygen. To reduce the risk of chemical accidents, solid sources of oxygen were transported instead. They are then reacted on site to produce oxygen. A common source of oxygen is potassium chlorate 5. Formula CClO3. So potassium chlorate 5. Okay, because it's inside the paragraph, so I want to write it down. It's KClO3. Right, this potassium chlorate 5. So this one undergoes thermal decomposition to form a chloride salt as well. So I know that if I heat this up, I will get a chloride also. Something chloride plus whatever thing that goes with it. Okay. Oh, plus oxygen, sorry. Because this one, I'm going to get oxygen, right? It's a common source of oxygen. So, next, the kick of oxygen in our lives. Okay, in 1907, Scientific American announced an invention of a new substance to produce oxygen with minimal of trouble. It was sodium peroxide, Na2O2. It's marketed as oxalif. It could produce oxygen at room temperature by reacting with carbon dioxide in the air. Okay, so this is one way it can react. You react with carbon dioxide, it'll give you the carbonate plus oxygen. It can also produce oxygen indirectly on contact with water. Why is it indirectly? Because first step, when it reacts with water, it's going to give you hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. Okay, this one, take note, star. Why star here? Sodium hydroxide and alkaline. So all of this must come to your mind. Ding, 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 ding. This one, carbonate. Okay, carbonate. Maybe reaction with acid. Question mark. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, all this must come to your mind. I got H2O2. Take note of this. H2O2. Uh, this is not H2O. Uh. H2O2 will then go through a second step to give me water plus oxygen. So this is ta-da, oxygen. That's why it's two steps. That's why it's, we call it indirectly. The reaction of water produces hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide then decomposes spontaneously to liberate oxygen gas. As the reaction do not require heating, oxalate could be placed on portable breathing apparatus and was easy to transport. It has been more than a hundred years since oxalate was lauded on the Ameri on the scientific American and is no longer used in modern self-contained breathing apparatus. Okay, question is why is it no longer used? Huh? Actually, this one question mark. 
Maybe because reaction is dangerous. Maybe. Okay, let's see whether question have asked later. Huh? Let's go on. First question. A part 1. When sufficient energy is supplied, okay, just not mentioned, right? Oxygen molecule can gain an electron to become a superoxide ion, O2 minus. Construct a half equation for the formation of superoxide. Okay, and then use the half equation to explain that it is oxidation and reduction. So first thing, O2, oxygen molecule, gain an electron. What does it become? Superoxide ion. So you realize this equation, actually, if you just read the question, you can get this equation already. So this is one mark. Next. Explain if it's oxidation or reduction. Because this is gain electron, this is a reduction process. Why? Because oxygen molecule gain one electron to form O2 minus. So the oxygen molecule gain one electron to form O2 minus. Okay, this is one way by the um, transfer of electrons method. If you want to go by oxidation state, take note the oxidation state of O decreases from zero because O2, the oxidation state is zero. OS equals to zero. In O2 minus, actually the oxidation state, you realize this single negative charge is split between two oxygen. So actually the oxidation state is a negative 0 0.5. Okay, so you say, Cheers, why so we have a negative 0 0.5? Yeah, okay, so this is where it gets a bit tricky. Lah. So, but don't worry, just go and do your normal calculation, you'll get it correct. Lah. So in this case, if you want to go by oxidation state, you're sort of telling me that the O, the oxidation state of O decreases from zero in O2 to negative 0 0.5 in O2 minus. So that's for A part 1. A part 2, they ask you to calculate the oxidation state of oxygen in superoxide. So that's what I've done here. So what we need to know is that the sum of oxidation state is equal to the overall charge. Therefore, each oxygen, let the oxidation state be x. So 2x, well, the oxidation state of these two add up together, must give me the overall charge, which is minus 1. So if you do your math, x equals to negative 0 0.5. Therefore, this one mark is over here. So that's A part 2. Part B over here, the name of superoxide suggests that the polyatomic ions of oxygen has exceptionally high reactivity. So it's very reactive. When you talk about reactivity, very high reactivity means it want to undergo bonding, right? Okay, want to undergo bonding. So making reference to the arrangement of electrons in superoxide ion explain why it is highly reactive. Okay? Now, actually I don't need to say this, lah. Okay, this one don't need to say because my focus is just on the superoxide ion. However, to help us to understand why oxygen is stable but superoxide is not stable, it's really because in oxygen, their valence shell is fully filled. Hence, they are relatively stable. So actually, I don't really need to include this, but this gives you a context. In the superoxide ion, one of the oxygen atoms only has seven electrons. It's in the question. So this is like lifting from the question and you're going to get one mark here. So why is it that seven electrons it is unstable? Because, because it only has seven electrons, it wants to gain or share an electron so that it can have a fully filled valence electron shell. Okay, so take note, it wants to have this fully filled valence electron shell. So therefore it will readily, the word is readily or easily gain or share an electron by reacting with another substance. Now, most of you just think of gain. But remember, this is oxygen. It is a non-metal. So it can either gain, which is forming your ionic bonding kind of uh, arrangement, right? Or it can share to further undergo your covalent bonding. So think of ionic, think of covalent because it's a non-metal. So just be careful. Most people only just think of gain because 7, gain 1, then okay lah. But gain has the ionic bonding component, the kind of thinking, because you literally transfer one electron over. But sharing is also another possible option. Okay, so take note. Part C. Write a balanced chemical equation for the de uh, decomposition of potassium chloride 5, which leads to the formation of oxygen gas. So I'm going to have potassium chloride, chloride 5, form oxygen gas. Then you know, if you read in the question, they say it's going to form a chloride salt as well. So, if you look at this whole question here, I got KClO3. I know that it's going to give me something chloride plus oxygen. Now, the only possible thing that can form a chloride with this is your potassium. Potassium chloride. Because oxygen cannot be OCL, right? Then where my K go to? 
cannot be CL, CL, it so doesn't make sense also. Therefore, your only answer left is K. So once I've formed the base equation, I need to balance it. So therefore, 2 over here, 2 over here, 3 over here. Some struggle with balancing because it's not your typical balancing that you usually do. Okay, but some of you got it quite easily. So take note of this. Form your base equation first, then you go and balance. Okay, don't try to balance and form the equation at the same time. You're going to die. Next, D part 1. Sodium peroxide present in oxalate is an ionic compound. The cation is sodium ion, while the anion is peroxide polyatomic ion. What does polyatomic ion mean? And deduce the chemical formula of the anion. So, actually, uh, peroxide, they already show you here, the right, in the question. You can see here, peroxide. O, two of them combined, charge is 2 minus. Therefore, I know directly it's O2, 2 minus. La, easy. Directly from the question. It's just whether you have read through the question properly or not. That's the first thing. Second thing, what exactly is polyatomic ion? This is the part where you need to refer back to your textbook, refer back to your knowledge that you have. So because a polyatomic ion is a charged particle, which tells you it's an ion, it consists, composes of two or more covalently bonded atoms. To form this polyatomic ion, actually, there's covalently bo covalent bonds within it. You may not uh, see you may not see it as of here, but actually the question gave you clues. Why? Can you see here? Covalent bond. Can you see here? Covalent bond. And question keeps referring this as polyatomic ions. So if I look at this in terms of context, I, it means that I have two, poly means more, right? Two or more, I two or more atoms covalently bonded, forming an ion overall. Okay, so that's really, if you infer from your reading, infer from the text itself by knowing what the different terms means, actually, it does help a bit in trying to get to the definition. Okay, so that is for this question over here, D part 1. Next. Okay, the peroxide polyatomic ion contains a single covalent bond between its atom. Actually, at the top, they already show already. All the atoms in the ions have eight valence electrons. Draw a dot and cross to show the arrangement of the outer shell electrons in the peroxide. So I know that the dot and cross, the bonding above, right, actually show this. Right, this is above in the data, they actually show this, right? They actually show this. So I'm going to copy this, like this. As I mentioned, to do dot and cross, if you've got the structural formula, which looks like this, actually it does help quite a lot. So I know because it's going to be an ion, so I know I'm going to definitely have this square bracket for 2 minus. I know that these two oxygen are covalently bonded. Single bond, so cross and dot. Oxygen here, oxygen here. Let's take it as the oxygen on the left is... Um, cross. So I know oxygen total have 6 electrons in the outer shell, right? So O, 8, 16. 2, 6. Outer shell only got 6 electrons. So 1 involved in bonding, I got 5 more to draw. This guy here is a circle. Dot. So 1 involved in bonding, I got 5 more to draw. Then this is where you check. They say all the atoms in the ion have 8 valence electrons. Now let's count. I use blue here to show you. On the left-hand side, I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's short of one more electron. So, this one more electron actually comes from the charge over here. So, I'm going to use a dot to illustrate that this electron actually comes from a separate, or a separate uh, element. Next thing, let's look at this green to show. 1, okay, let's dot, uh, so I got 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 7 electrons only, I don't have 8 valence electrons, hence there must be one more electron from somewhere, which is from the 2 minus, coming here to form my 8 valence electrons. So therefore, this is the structure I'm looking at here. Okay, of course, remove all the numbers. Okay, remove all the numbers. Remove all numbers. Okay, let me remove the numbers here. And then let's draw the needle back again. So this is how it actually looks. Okay? Now, if you draw a cross here and then a dot here, actually we are fine with it. Lah, because um, this really testing, stretching you a little bit. Hence, if your symbol is not totally accurate as of that, I think we are fine with it. Okay, at least for this question. Okay?
So take note, this is for the drawing. E, describe and explain the observation when water is added to oxalate and the pH of the resulting mixture is tested with universal indicator. So I want to find out what would I observe when water is added to oxalate. I need to think in terms of the pH. And I tell you that there's universal indicator. So this tells you obviously some acid-base reaction I'm looking at. So let's go back. Let's see what happens when oxalate is added to water. When oxalate is added to water, which is down here, you realize, che, alkali. I got alkali, NaOH form. So first thing mentioned, che, I am going to, when, add, when added to water, oxalate actually produces sodium hydroxide. It is an alkali. So what is an alkali going to do to the pH? It will actually cause the pH to increase to greater than 7. And what's going to happen to the universal indicator? Because they ask you, right, universal indicator. It's actually going to turn blue, violet or purple, depending on how extreme the change in terms of the pH. So we are fine with any of this. So this is for this question over here. Not a very difficult question if you really take time to digest step by step. Those of you who already lack time near the end, the more you panic, the worse it gets. Lah. So read through and note it. This is definitely going to help. Next, B9. So table 9.1 shows the observations made when different metals zinc, X, Y, and Z are reacted with excess dilute nitric acid separately and has been exposed to air for a period. So experiment 1, zinc react with acid. So all these are reaction with acid. Lah. Okay, but they are first have been exposed. Now, it is exposed to air thing for a period. Lah. Most probably, we are looking at the, you know, there will be a layer. Okay, oxidation would have occurred, lah, oxidation. So your metal wouldn't be exposed directly. Okay, there will be a layer of oxide that's formed. Okay, so layer of oxide formed. That's why you pick up all these little, little things here. So experiment 1, zinc, acid with zinc. No effervescence observed in the beginning. This is a bit weird, right? Because we know zinc is actually quite reactive. But how come there's no effervescence in the beginning? There should be a reaction, but it doesn't happen in the beginning. But it happens after 5 minutes. So between 0 to 5 minutes, okay, something else is happening. Okay, Before the real reaction of zinc reacts with HNO3. Okay, what is this effervescence? You know, metal plus acid, most probably if you think about it, this should be hydrogen gas. Down here, no H2 gas produced. How come? Or no gas produced. How come? Okay, that will be the question here. Ask yourself. X, no visible reaction. So X plus your HNO3, no visible reaction. Okay, most likely a non-reactive metal. Unreactive one, huh? Y, moderately rapid reaction observed. Green solution observed at the end. This green solution actually is quite distinct of Fe2+. So when I see green, I'm a suspect. Eh? Maybe, maybe it's Fe2+. Plus, huh? Chance maybe it's quite high that it's Fe2+. Plus. In your syllabus, green solution actually you only got Fe2+. Plus, huh? So this one should be Fe2+. Plus. That means this guy here should be iron. Maybe, huh? Okay, so these are the clues you must pick up from there. Last one, Z, vigorous reaction observed. So this is quite a fast reaction. So actually comparing all of this, I know that Z most probably is the most reactive metal. Followed by maybe Y or zinc, but they never describe the reaction between zinc and iron. So, therefore, I don't really know from observation which is more reactive. But from your metal reactivity series, you will know. Lah. Okay? Can? You all know, right? Zinc and iron, which one is more reactive, right? Oh, so, okay, ah, zinc is more reactive than iron. Ah. So, just think about ah, zinc is more reactive. Ah. Okay, so, you can see, that's why this one, no description. It's a bit weird to say it's less reactive. Ah. Okay, so, B9, part A. This total 4 marks. Huh? 4 marks allocation tells you that, well, that most likely there's quite a fair bit of things to write. So, what you need to explain, actually, there's two parts. Why no effervescence in the beginning? Okay, why no effervescence observed in the beginning? Why it is only seen after 5 minutes? So, why beginning don't have, why after 5 minutes have? So, this has to do with this idea of being exposed to the air. So, zinc being quite reactive, actually forms a layer of zinc oxide when exposed to air. Okay? So because it's exposed to air, there's a layer of zinc oxide, which means that if this is my zinc metal, when it re when it's exposed to air, there's this layer, this blue color that I'm coloring here is actually your zinc oxide. So 
if my acid is in contact with if I put this whole thing here in acid, I make sure then use blue, uh, then use a uh, different color. Let's use pink. Okay, let's use pink. So if I put it in nitric acid, shh, you realize my zinc metal in the middle, okay, is not in contact with the acid. Okay, my zinc oxide is the one that's reacting first. So, first explanation: a layer of zinc oxide is actually formed when exposed is formed when exposed to air. So this will be the thing that's initially reacting with dilute nitric acid. It actually forms water and zinc nitrate. What do you realize? Water and zinc nitrate, there's no gas produced. And since there's no liberation of gaseous products, or since there's no gas produced, hence there's no effervescence. So layer of zinc oxide, important to say. Next, saying what the products are and indicating that there's no gas, that will be the, where the second mark goes to. So don't just link zinc oxide, then no gas produced. Say what products are formed, and hence that's why there's no gas. After that, they say, five minutes later, why is there the reaction? It's really because after five minutes, the zinc oxide has been fully reacted. So all my zinc oxide is gone, so the whole blue layer is gone. So now my zinc can react with my nitric acid. So the zinc is now exposed. It's able to react with nitric acid. And this will actually form hydrogen gas plus zinc nitrate. Okay, this hydrogen gas is the one that, cause, that causes the effervescence. So you might want to say that and to form hydrogen, which causes the effervescence. So this will actually make your answer more complete to say that you understand where the effervescence comes from. It's actually because of the hydrogen. Part B. Suggest an identity for metal Y and construct a balanced chemical equation for the reaction. So, as I mentioned, the clue of what metal Y is is actually based on the color of the solution. So a green solution is very unique, very uh, characteristic of a iron 2 ion. So therefore, my suggestion would be the metal is iron, but the ion is actually Fe2+. So take note, some people actually wrote iron 2 as the metal. Take note, when you write the word met iron 2, this is no longer the metal. Uh. This is no longer the metal already. Okay, so you cannot write iron 2 metal. This is no such thing. Okay, so iron is the metal. I know the product that's going to form is iron 2. So therefore, Fe plus HNO3 give me my iron 2 nitrate plus hydrogen gas. So just balance your equation and this will be it. Okay, so simple equation formation, very simple balancing. Now, do take note, whenever they ask you for chemical equation, balance chemical equation, do I really need to write state symbols? So no need to write state symbols, huh? unless, unless following. So generally, you don't need to write state symbols huh? unless it is first thing ionic equation. Yeah, if it's an ionic equation, then Dai Dai must write state symbols lah, because ionic equation needs state symbols before you can then start to split them up into their respective ions. Second thing, question say to include state symbol. Okay, so to include state symbol, they say to include state symbol, then you can include it. Okay, and if you got blast furnace, blast furnace is another one that you is good to include all the state symbols because with the blast furnace you know that quite a fair bit will be talking about the uh, whether is it molten or whether is it a uh, gaseous form or whether is it like uh, solid and things like this. So these are the three that you should include state symbols. Okay. Other than that, you just want to write balance chemical cohesion. Don't backside each you can write uh, state symbols. Huh? Okay. Can. Okay. So just take note. Next one. Okay, so next one, part C. So a student carried out an experiment to study the reactivity of metals Y and Z. So this is a continuation. Huh? So you already know that the metals is zinc, X, Y, and Z already. Now they are just further using Y and Z to react. Okay, but this is actually the thermal decomposition of the carbonates of these metals. So I'm not putting metal Y, metal Z in. I'm putting the Y carbonate. Okay, so the metal carbonate, Y carbonate, I'm putting Z carbonate inside. So just take note of this. 
Table 9.2 shows the loss in mass when carbonate undergo thermal decomposition. Now, because it's a carbonate, when you heat them up, you are most probably going to get the oxide plus CO2 gas. And because this is a gas, you know that mass will be lost. So this loss in mass is due to carbon dioxide being liberated. Okay, so these are the link that you should be doing as you are doing these questions. Next. Um, metal Y, metal Z, so this is the data here. What you have is initial mass is both 2 grams. After heating, you realize, oh, this one has a larger drop. This one minus 0 0.52. This one only minus 0 0.10 grams. Okay? Observation, moderately rapid formation of black solid. That means reaction quite fast. Quite fast, huh? because moderately rapid of the black solid. Whereas for Z, no observable change. It's like Matiam, no change at all yet. No reaction. Okay. Oh, not much, huh? Using the information from table 9.1, 9.2, what can you conclude about the relationship between the reactivity of the metal and the rate of thermal decomposition? So I got the reactivity of the metal to think about. Rate of thermal decomposition of the receptive carbonates. Second thing to think about. So let's compare the reactivity first. I know Z is more reactive than Y. How do I know? Because when I go to table 9.1, Z is a vigorous reaction. Y is a moderately rapid reaction. So therefore, based on the description of the reaction, I know that Z is more reactive. So my point I'm trying to make Z is more reactive, right? But I need information. So the data is, there's vigorous reaction seen for metal Z but a moderately rapid reaction observed for metal Y. This tells me that Z is more reactive than metal Y. Okay, so I need the data. So what's the point you're making? What's the data you're helping to support? So that is for the reactivity. How about the rate of thermal decomposition? So rate of thermal decomposition, I know that metal carbonate of Z undergo thermal decomposition slower than metal carbonate of Y. How do I know? Because after 10 minutes, there are two data I can use. One, look at the description. No observable change for Z. Okay. But then there's a moderate rapid formation of a black solid for Y. So this indicates that a slower or no reaction for metal carbonate of Z compared to Y. Lah. Okay, so this is the point, the data. I can get the qualitative data. Or the other one I can go for quantitative one, which is from table 9.2. The metal carbonate of Z has only a drop of 0 0.1 gram. So you can see here 0 0.1 gram, only a drop of 0 0.1 gram of mass. You want to be more kiasu, you can write from 2.00 gram to 1.90 gram. While metal carbonate of Y has a drop of 0 0.52 grams from 2.00 to 1.49 gram after 10 minutes of heating. So I go by the drop of the mass and I use my data to code. I code my data here and I purposely evaluated the data. So instead of saying 2 to 1.42, I say minus 0 0.52. Because I know there's a drop from 2 to 1.42. And actually, this is a typo. Okay, so just take note of this. These are the points made. But you realize I haven't concluded what is the relationship over here. So my final conclusion is that the more reactive the metal is, the slower the rate of decomposition. Because Z is more reactive, but it, de thermal decomposes, it undergoes thermal decomposition slower. So therefore, this is my conclusion here. I must say that this is very demanding for two marks. Okay? But, as I mentioned, okay, not as I mentioned, I'm going to say that different question has different demand, different difficulty as well. So, in terms of the demand-wise is what we expect out of you, or you realize that it's quite a fair bit of things you must write. So, some of you may say, Chia, how do I know how much to write for these two marks? Look at the question itself. I need to take information from table 9.1, information from table 9.2. Therefore, I die, die must include from there. Therefore, I got this. I got this. And then finally, I must conclude about the relationship. And hence, I got this. Okay, so this is how you go about tackling this question itself. Okay, now let me take a pause. I'm going to drink some water because I've been talking for 1 hour 30 minutes already. Okay, let's carry on from here. Drink water finish already. So let's carry on. Okay, so now we are looking at the last two questions now. It's either a B10 or is the all B10 option. So let's start from the either B10 option. Huh? So first thing, 
Thermal decomposition of rubidium superoxide, so once again your superoxide, RBO2, has been studied in the temperature range of 280 to 360 degrees Celsius. The reaction must be carried out on a Pyrex glass high vacuum system. So what is this reaction we are looking at? Okay, we are looking at it, um, thermal decomposition, we are heating it up, and this actually forms your RB2O2 plus O2. So there's a production of oxygen there. Four experiments were conducted to investigate the decomposition of RBO2. The concentrations of RBO2 were measured and recorded at the start of the experiment. So this feels like a speed of reaction kind of thing, right? Okay, so as you're reading through, ask yourself what topics could be included here. So at least you are preparing your mind already. Uh, so the concentrations of RB2 were measured and recorded at the start of the experiment and after 90 seconds. So concentration after 90 seconds, the results are shown in the table below. Okay, so I know experiment. This is the initial, this is after 90 seconds for the concentration of RBO2. Okay, this is the amount of decrease in concentration. How do I know? Because from here I can see it's just a subtraction of. Then there's this uh, MnO2 in grams. Okay, so I don't know what this is. Let's see what there is later on. Initial temperature. Okay, in experiment 2, the temperature of RBO2 at the start of the reaction was increased to uh, 300. In this case here, let's go for 130, uh, 130 degrees Celsius. In experiment 4, a small amount of MnO2 was mixed with RbO2 at the start of the experiment. So this is added for experiments 4. I don't know what it's for, but I know that MnO2 at the start and at the end stays the same. No change. Okay, no change. So first thing, calculate the decrease in concentration of RbO2 for experiment 1, 2, 4 and fill in your answers in the table above. So the decrease is really just take this minus this to get the answer. Okay, unless you press your calculator wrongly, otherwise you should get your full one mark here. Okay, so 10 minus 0, 10, this is not a trick question. 5 minus 3.2, 1.78, 5 minus 4.28, 0 0.72. So a simple one mark. Then they say, explain the effect of concentration of RBO2 on the rate of reaction. So I took a rate of reaction by comparing the data of two appropriate experiments. So I want to only have concentration being the main thing here. So I want to have the effect of concentration measured here. So I should have all other variable constant. Okay, then only this one is my change. So I need to pick two temperatures the same. So I know this guy is out already. I cannot compare this. I know that for my first one, for my one and four, 4 got manganese oxide at the MnO2, so I know this one I cannot compare. So I can only compare 1 and 3. So I choose to compare experiment 1 and 3, because why? 3 start off with 10, more per dm cube. 1 start with 5, more per dm cube. So you can see here, I can measure the effect of concentration. So 3 has a higher initial concentration of Rb2O, and shows a greater decrease in concentration after 90 seconds. How do I know? Higher concentration, the decrease, can you see as I compare, it shows a greater decrease. Okay, so that is the effect of the concentration on the rate of reaction. It shows a greater decrease after 90 seconds. Okay, this one, actually, no, sorry, this is not the rate. Uh, this is just what has happened. I Because I need to supply data, right? I need to compare, right? Comparing the data. Uh, so how much should I do? I first say, experiment 1 has initial concentration of 5 mol per dm cube. After 9 seconds, after, sorry, after 90 seconds, it's dropped by 0 0.72 to, to 4.28 mol per dm cube. So I showed that the drop is this amount. If I start with a higher concentration, okay, actually it dropped from 10 to 7 point, sorry, let's be consistent here. So it dropped from 10 to 7.46. Therefore, the drop is actually 2.54. So what does the drop signify? Because it is all within 90 seconds. So the time is the same. But one of them, the drop is more, right? So therefore, I can conclude that the higher initial concentration of the reactants, the higher the initial concentration of reactants, the faster the rate of the reaction because there is a greater decrease after 90 seconds. So this actually explains your rate with a consistent time you just look out for which one has a greater decrease. All right, so that's for part B. So you realize, I suppose you have the point and the data and the conclusion here, so that you realize how we are we quoting in the data. Okay? Ken? 
I will now go on to part C. Okay, what's the role of MnO2 in experiment 4? So you realize you can't just add it for no good reason, right? So as I look at my data, I compare 3 and 4, actually temperature is the same, concentration is the same at the start, but wow, suddenly the concentration dropped by 10. So therefore this guy MnO2 must have sped up the reaction, right? And itself did not change. So therefore I know it's catalyst. It's a catalyst. And whatever I said just now, obviously is, it would be most probably the explanation. Nah. So therefore in part D, we reference the table 10.1, give two reasons, two reasons to explain your answer in part C. So how do you know it's catalyst? I know catalyst first will speed up the reaction. Okay, so I know it increase the speed of reaction. How do I know? Because comparing experiment 3 and 4 where the initial concentration and temperature are the same, by adding MnO2, it actually caused the concentration of Rb2O to decrease by a greater amount. Decrease by 10 for experiment 4 versus a decrease of 2.54 for experiment 3. Right, so you realize that I quoted data within my explanation itself. Right, because they ask you for the data, ma, you don't quote data, you should lie on. So you must support with data. So this is for the first reason. It's because the speed of reaction actually is increased. Right, there's an increased speed of reaction. Right, when the MnO2 is added. Second thing, the mass of MnO2 stays constant. Please tell me how much at 0 0.5 gram from the start to the end of experiment 4. Hence, this show that it remains chemically unchanged at the start and uh, unchanged at the end of the reaction. From the start to the end, there's no change to the MnO2. Okay, a lot of you forgot to quote that 0 0.5 gram. The 0 0.5 gram is the data to show you that there's no change. Okay, so please quote your data. Okay, part E, using the ideas on collision theory and activation energy, explain the effect on the differences in temperature between experiment 1 and 2. So you know experiment 2 is faster. I mean, clear cut, right? The initial concentration is the same, but there's a greater drop. There's no addition of catalyst, it's just a temperature difference. So, what do I need to do? Think of your speed of reaction. What happens when there's a higher temperature? The particles will now have more Ke, right? With more Ke, what does it mean? They are moving faster. So they collide more often, right? Next thing, the particles have energy equal. There will be more particles, more reacting particles with energy equal or greater than the activation energy. So there's actually two reasons why temperature causes the reaction to be faster. One is moving faster. Second thing, there are more particles with energy equal or greater than activation energy. So this causes an increase in the frequency of effective collision. Now, please don't say number. It's not about the numbers of effective collision. It's actually about the frequency because it's about speed here. We are looking at how frequent. It's about the rate. It's about the per unit time. Therefore, you need to use the word frequency. Okay, so this is for part E over here. So this is a very standard, very okay, standard answer. Okay, from your speed of reaction chapter. Next, Let's go to all. Oh, this is on organic. Okay, so alkynes and alkenes. Okay, man, homologous series. So this start off by saying this. So homologous series are like the family, right? Family. So alkenes, alkynes, alkenes, they are different family. So alkenes, I know, have C double bond C. Alkynes, what are they, right? They say alkynes contain a C, C triple bond. Then they give you the table 10.1. So first formula. C2H2, so weird, right? How does it look? You can see over here, there's a triple bond here. That's why it's an alkyne. You know F stands for 2 carbon. Then of course, this YNE stands for it's an alkyne. It's the name of the alkyne. So next one, C3H4. So it's a 3 carbon with H4, right? So I'm going to draw 3 carbon. So actually, how do I do this? I'll first draw 3 carbons. Next, insert the functional group. Draw a triple bond. Next, fill up each carbon must have four bonds. So this carbon has three bonds, right? I draw one more H to make it have four bonds. This carbon already have four bonds, one on three, one on the right side, three on the left side, so I don't draw any more. This carbon here, got to draw three more bonds. So that's why I got CH3 over here. What's the name of it? Prop is for three carbon, Y and E for alkyne. Last one, C4H6. So I'm going to draw three 
for four carbons. Okay, so I know, sorry, the drawing is already there. I the last one easy lah. Four carbons, six hydrogen. So just count from the diagram, and you can actually get the answer C four H six. Now use the information on ten point one. Deduce the general formula of alkyne. So this one really you need to think lah. So C two, C three, C four. So it's really C N because two carbon, two carbon, three carbon, three carbon. So it's a C N. Hydrogen increased by two, increased by two, increased by two. But do you realize this is a two, four, six? Can you see the plus two plus two plus two, right? C two. Hey, do you realize this is actually a two times one? This is a two times two. This is a two times three. So this number here coincides with the number of carbons, but it's just at one less. So therefore, it's actually C n H two times n minus one. 2 times n minus 1 because you realize 2 times 1. How do you get 1? It's actually 1 minus the number of carbon. This 2 times 2, the 2 actually is 3 minus 3 number of 3 carbon minus 1. Now here is 2 times 3 to get 6. 3 is actually 4 carbon minus 1. So therefore, this is the formula here. You don't have the bracket there. I simplify it to Cn H2n minus 2. Right, so it's a bit like your math doing patterns. Okay, doing patterns here. Part 3. Alcohols are another homogeneous series of organic compounds. Draw a dot and cross diagram show the bonding in a molecule of methanol. So meth is one carbon. Anol, alcohol. Okay, show only the valence electron, so only outer shell only. So first thing I'm going to draw is the structural formula. So it's going to be a one carbon alcohol. So next thing, draw functional group. Functional group is OH. Next, every carbon must have four bonds. So this carbon only got one bond. I'm gonna draw three more H to make it complete. So this is my methanol. Once I've drawn my structural formula, now let's draw the dot and cross. So one carbon bonded to a H on top, bonded to a H on the left side, bonded a H to the right side. On the on the bottom, on the right side, I got oxygen. This oxygen bonded to another H. Each time I got a single bond, I draw a cross dot. Cross dot, cross dot, cross dot, cross dot. Hydrogen will go for a duplet structure. That means two oxygen, two electron in the outer shell. Carbon and oxygen, they will go for the octet. So which means that they will have eight electron in the outer shell. So focus. Okay, now let's look at each hydrogen first. Within the circle of each hydrogen, how many electrons do you see? So within this blue circle, you realize I got two electrons. This circle, two electrons. This circle, two electrons. This circle, two electrons. So you realize, okay, all the hydrogen have two electrons in the outermost shell, duplet. So the bonding settled. It is stable because it has a duplet structure now. Next, let's look at oxygen. Then let's look at carbon first. Carbon, let's use a green circle. It needs to have an octet structure. So, 8 electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There's 8 electrons within the green circle itself. So, carbon has 8 electrons in the outermost shell. So, therefore, carbon settled. Last one is oxygen. So, let's use pink. A pink, no, you're not so nice. Huh? Let's use orange. Uh, purple, uh, purple, uh. So, oxygen here. Oxygen octet structure. So far, it has one, two, three, four. So, I'm short of four more electrons. Hence, I'm going to do cross over here. Okay. So, this one, oxygen, I'll put a cross over there. Okay. Then, it is stable now. We have eight electrons in the outermost shell. Some people may ask, sure, can I put dot or can I put cross? Actually, dot or cross doesn't matter. Okay, as long as you go and count properly that the thing is really alternating. The dot and the cross is alternating. Okay. Next, draw the product of but one in of bromination. So bromination is actually the addition of bromine okay, to the Double bond 
okay, for alkene. But if this is an alkyne, then I'm going to add to the triple bond. All right, let's assume that it's only added once. Let's assume that it's added once. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to draw for you, all right? So I'm going to draw my but one in first. All right, so I'm going to draw my but one in. Okay, what I'll typically do is I'll leave the bottom empty. So I'll arrange my atoms in such a way that my bottom is empty. Okay, then I've got my CH2, CH3. So this is my build one in. Oh, sorry, build. I sorry, we yeah. are. This is my build one in. Okay, build one lean. Now I'm gonna show my bromine coming in from the bottom. Okay, bromine coming from the bottom. Now what's gonna happen now is for my bromination to occur, I'm gonna break one of the bond from between the carbon. I'm going to break the bond between the bromine and I'm going to establish a bond between the carbon and the bromine. Carbon and the bromine. Okay, so I repeat again. Huh? So how exactly does this addition work? Huh? Okay, so let me show you again. So when bromine is added to the, double, to the bonds over here, what's going to happen? The first step is that I'm going to break the bond between the carbon. One of the bond between the two carbons. I'm going to break the bond between the bromine. Now the bromine is free to move. The carbon is now short of one bond, right? So what's going to happen here is that the carbon on the left-hand side will bond to one with the bromine. The carbon on the right-hand side will bond to the other bromine. So now, my product. Please don't just write this as a product. I'll smack you. Huh? Okay, so after the reaction, you're going to get H, C. This carbon at the bottom is bonded to one bromine. Double bond over here. Carbon here. Bromine, CH2, CH3. So this is the product for your bromination. Okay? So what we're looking at is you have your four carbons with the bromine attached, two bromine attached properly. Next is the correct arrangement. Okay, your double bond, your carbon, hydrogen, all done properly. So that's how the marks are awarded for this in terms of the two marks. Part B. Show that the polymer to show that the polymer contains silver, the following test was carried out. The polymer fibers were chopped into small pieces and gently warmed with dilute nitric acid. Okay, so they warm with dilute nitric acid to let it react. They say the silver atoms were oxidized to silver ions. So my silver atoms became silver ions. The mixture was filtered and aqueous sodium chloride was added to the filtrate and an insoluble solid was formed. So Ag plus added to sodium chloride. You think carefully. What is the thing that's going to react? Can Ag plus react with sodium? No. But can Ag plus react with my chloride? Answer is yes. What is actually this reaction is your precipitation. Where you have aqueous silver ions with aqueous chloride ions coming together to give you your solid silver chloride. Okay, so this insoluble solid that's formed is actually your silver chloride. And hence, answer for part 2. Why was the mixture filtered? Filtered, huh? Okay, it's actually to remove excess insoluble substance. What is this insoluble substance? We don't know. Lah. Okay, why I say we don't know? Because you realize it was filtered at this stage here. Okay, before your chloride was added. Right, before your chloride is added, it's filtered there. So I do not know what is in the polymer. I do not know what is in the polymer, but I know that uh, there's a lot of other chunks of solids there. So the filtration actually is to make sure that I can get my silver in the filtrate. So this silver is in the filtrate. Okay. Then the rest of the things, such as your polymer and whatever, this is removed. Okay, this is removed. Okay? That's why it is being filtered. So this is your one mark here. So this is really a test of a separation technique. What exactly happens during your filtration. Okay, so this is the end of the paper. So that's the end of me going through. I spent less than two hours going through this. Hooray! Okay, so all the best. Let's for your next paper.